I think it's safe to say that um, each and every one of us has this moment that we think defines <coughs> us, you know, sometime in the past. Uh, for me, um, okay, sorry, I'll explain to why the game was necessary. Um, all of the people that you had written on your for like that were written on the forehead, have um, something that defines them. Like Britney Spears, I gave I gave Alana the hint that she had a real rough patch in 2007 because Alana had Britney Spears. Um, they all have um, the way that you were able to figure it out were the things that defined them. Well, for us, what should define us is when we're baptized because that's the moment we decide. God, I don't want to be in control of this anymore, because I know that you can do a better job than what I can do. Uh, for the longest time, I let myself believe, and I defined myself as unlovable. I looked at myself in the mirror, and I thought, if anyone saw what I saw when I looked in the mirror, they wouldn't love that, because I didn't love that. I didn't love what I looked at. So I thought that I was unlovable, and it took me a really long time and a baptism to get over that. It took me a long time to get over that, because I thought I wasn't good enough. But when God looks at us, he doesn't just see us for the person that we were two minutes ago, the person we were ten years ago, or the person we are right now. He looks at us in our entire existence, the person we were from the moment we were born to forever after that, and even before that, because he knew us before we were formed. He looks at our entire being, and I think that the best example of that is Saul. Now I'm talking about the Saul turned Paul, not the other Saul in the beginning of the Bible. Let me tell you, there was a real confusion with that for me when I was researching this. Um, so when I, when I thought of Saul turned Paul, I thought of um, how I would describe Saul. Because this guy wasn't, he wasn't kind, he wasn't loving. He took the people that believed in Jesus with their whole hearts, and he said, oh, hey, I see that you believe in Jesus. I'm just going to throw you in jail right now because I don't believe in that, and I think that you're wrong. So you're going in jail. So I would have a couple of words to describe him. So it's a good thing I didn't write when... It's a good thing I didn't write Acts because when um, God describes Saul, he didn't go, this guy was a murderer, blah, 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 blah. This is actually exactly how Saul is described. This is... Acts 7, 58. Um, Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. A young man. That's how Saul's described. Not for what he's done or what he will become. He's just labeled a young man. That's it. I mean, Saul imprisoned Jesus' followers. So he could have been defined as much worse. He could have been in fact like defined as impatient and rude and jealous and proud and self-seeking. That's not how Jesus works. That's just not how my loving God works. Um, <clears throat> because he loved Paul so much that he decided to look past the Saul that Paul was. That, that's what I think is most beautiful about the Saul-Paul transformation. That he just, he looked right past Saul and said, I've forgiven that. I've thrown that into the sea of forgetfulness and... This is who you are, because I love Paul. And Paul went on to do great and amazing things. Um, and when you read about Saul, like the actual Saul man, um, like in Acts 8, verse 3, But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Home is where you're supposed to feel secure. And he was going into that and taking them out of their security and throwing them into jail because he didn't agree with what they believed in. Um, so, you can call me a hopeless romantic, but I'm going to read an excerpt out of my favorite love story. <clears throat> the Bible. <laughs> Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against Jesus' disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? Lord, Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what to do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They had heard the sound, but did not, did not see anyone. 
Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So, so they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias, and Jesus called him, said, Ananias. Yes, Jesus, he asked. Um, and Yeshua said, Go to the house on Judas, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now if I was Ananias and I heard that I had to go heal a man that's been throwing fellow Jesus' disciples and followers in jail, I would have said, you know God, <coughs> I don't know if you know this, but Saul is, is blind. If I went to kill him, he wouldn't even see it coming. It would be an easy fight. <laughs> But Ananias is, the, the, is trusted in God and loved God so much that he said, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. He didn't say, what should I do? He just stated facts at this point. Um, and Yeshua said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, uh, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, regained his strength. Ananias didn't second quest, like he didn't question God's will. He just said, "Okay," went up and healed him. He didn't, he didn't think, "Well, I don't know, is that really my job?" Or he didn't, he didn't think, "Well, well, well God, what if I'm not enough to do this?" He just said, "Okay, you, you know the facts. I've placed them in front of you. I'm just gonna do what you said." And Saul was healed. He was he immediately. He was healed. But my favorite part of this is when. Jesus calls him a chosen instrument. That, to me, is complete love. He looked at Saul and said, You are my chosen instrument. You are persecuting me, and you're still my chosen instrument. Um, and because Saul would eventually have faith and trust in Jesus, that's how he became great. So then Saul went off, and he began to preach with a man named Barnabas, and uh, Saul ended up listening to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sent them to this place and to that place, and I could go through it, but you should probably just read Acts, because it's an amazing chapter. Especially the chosen instrument part, I would go over that a couple times. Um, but I'm going to skip to Acts 13, 9 to 12. Then Saul, who was also called Paul. So now Saul is dead. He is now Paul. So Saul is completely gone. Now this is Paul. <clears throat> Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked and said, you are, you are a child of the devil. Oh, sorry. I should give some background on this. <laughs> it is. Okay. So um, Saul and Barnabas listened to the Holy Spirit and were sent to Cyprus where they met a false prophet and a sorcerer. So Saul, I can imagine, knew a lot about this considering he was evil. So listen is important. You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of Yeshua? Now the hand of Yeshua is against you. You are going to be blind for a time and not able to see the light of the sun. Now I wonder where he got that from. <laughs> that would be because he went through that. He could recognize this in other people because that's what he saw in Saul. Immediately mist and darkness came over him and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by hand. Uh, when the pro-council saw what happened, he believed and he was amazed at the teaching about Yeshua. So Paul was able to use um, his, like what Satan meant for evil, that was Saul, God turned to good through this. Because Paul could look at that and he knew exactly what it was because he was that. And he was able to... Um, God was able to use Paul to turn that into good. And this is, like, 
fully shown um, in Acts 13, verse 38, when Paul says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know, uh, sorry, I want you to know that through Jesus the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification that you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that uh, take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Paul knew what the forgiveness of Jesus was because he felt it. And he was able to convince everyone else because they knew the story of Saul and how Paul became Paul. How he became new through Jesus. So then... Um, God was able to send Paul to strengthen churches and preach his word, and eventually um, Paul ended up suffering the fate that he had given to other people. We just have to find where that is, sorry. Excuse me. Okay, so... Paul ended up getting arrested um, because he was preaching the word. And I can imagine that throughout the time that Paul was being arrested, flogged, and put into jail, he was laughing because he wouldn't be afraid because their perfect love casts out fear. So he wouldn't be afraid because he knew that God has perfect love. And I don't remember, I didn't write down where the verse was. Um, <clears throat> but Paul, while Paul was in jail... Um, an earthquake happened because he was shackled because no one wanted him to escape. So Paul was in jail and an earthquake happened and that's how he ended up becoming free from jail because an earthquake happened and shattered the prison around him and the shackles. And uh, the man that was watching Paul uh, was about to kill himself because he thought that all of the prisoners escaped and Paul said, hey, no, don't do that. I haven't gone anywhere because Paul trusted um, Jesus enough to know that his life is in Jesus' hands. So he saved a man's life, and he was great, even though he was in a bad situation. I'm just going to... Okay. Love is directly opposed to the senses. The senses have been trained to put themselves and their desires above anything else. self selfishly seeking their own way. But love, the word says, does not seek its own rights or its own way. And we walk in love. You must demand that your senses, or your flesh, be subject to the word. Without a definite decision, you will not continue uh, in the love of God. So commit yourself to agape, agape, God's love now. And when temptation comes, you'll remember your decision and obey love. And this is just saying that if you love God, you'll listen to his commandments, like he asked you to do. Um, and I was going to talk to you about the commandments, but the game ran longer, so I think you know about the commandments. Um, the main point of what I wanted to go through in the commandments is that, uh, number one, because it is number one, it is most important. You need to love Jesus, because only Jesus can bless you. And only God can bless you. Um, there is no fear in love. And not having fear is going to allow you to have courage to do what is right. So if uh, Saul hadn't had the courage to do what was right, he would have never become Paul. And Paul is the one that went out and did great things, not Saul. Uh, in my opinion, it's difficult to be unsuccessful when you walk in love. Actually, that's not even my opinion. It's difficult to be unsuccessful when you walk in love. Because when you're being patient, you're not going to make rash decisions. When you're being kind, you're... Um Sorry, what was that? Did you want to share that with the whole class yes, there, you? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you said if you're patient, you won't make rash decisions. And I said if, you're, if you've got a rash, you won't make patient decisions. <laughs> Note to self, don't ask you to share with the class. 
He will just share rashes with the class. <laughs> I guess the main point is, I'm going to ignore all the scribbles because they're very confusing and I shouldn't have written them. Um, I didn't learn to tie my shoes until I was six. And when I learned to tie my shoes, it took me like three hours. Because I sat there and I looked at these, this one piece of string and I thought, how do you tie this together? This doesn't make any sense and how do you make this piece of string make your shoe tighter? And then I had like my dad coming and going, oh no, you gotta do the bunny ear way. And I had my grandma going, no, you have to do the loop and the round of the loop and around the hole. And then they tried to throw in rabbits somewhere in there. And it was very confusing. And that's probably why it took three hours. But I just remember sitting there with my shoelaces in my hand, in my fists, no doubt, um, just getting so angry. And I kept going, I can't do this. And also this is stupid. I'll just wear Velcro. Velcro shoes. It'd be really cool when I'm 16 and don't know how to tie my shoes. Uh, but eventually I learned because I stopped saying, I can't do this. And I started saying, I'm going to try to do this. And that I'm going to try to do this turned into, oh my goodness, it's happening. I'm tying my shoe. And the praise from my grandparents was enormous because they were tired of trying to teach me how to tie my shoes. Apparently three hours is much too long for a person to learn. <laughs> When I try to define myself, I do a very poor job. Because some days I'm like, yeah, I'm the best. And then other days I'm like, wow, I'm just the worst. Because I look at myself and I only see myself in that one day. And when I only see myself in that one day, that's not who I am. Because I'm the sum of all of my days. Not just the ones that were, but the ones that are to come as well. So by letting God lead you to what you're supposed to be, that's how you become successful. Because God's going to lead you in the right path. If you just try to do it your own way, you're going to take three hours to learn how to tie your shoes. Um, this is actually my favorite scripture. And that's why it's uh, got a yellow sticky note and yellow highlight, it's highlighted in yellow. Because it is very important. And I just really like hearing it, so I hope you enjoy hearing it as much as I like reading it. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All those who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. All those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who rage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am Yeshua, your God, who takes, you, who takes hold of your right hand and says, Do not fear, I will help you. So when I think I can't do something, I just need to read that whole verse and then go, So do not fear, I will help you learn to tie your shoes, or do whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Because it doesn't matter um, what Jesus sends you to do, he's going to help you do, to do it. And when you say, I can't do something, you're saying, God, the God that's in me, so you, you can't do this. And you're not letting God let you be successful. And uh, that's, that's my sermon, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good.